welcome to West Coast Focus, sponsored by Backscatter Underwater Video and Photo right here in Monterey. I'm your host, Steve Zmack, and today we are going deep, exploring a wide variety of underwater photography. Photographers take people where they can't normally get to themselves. The expanse of space, the depths of the ocean, into the microscopic and invisible. As artists competing in a world where literally everyone is a photographer, we have to challenge ourselves and ask, what can I do that other photographers are unable or unwilling to do? Where can I go that is beyond the reach of most? What can I show the world that it hasn't seen before? And how can I make my audience feel like they've never felt before? Today, we have a lineup of photographers who have addressed those questions head on, and we'll get to see and learn from their answers. So set your imagination to infinity, jack up the ISO on your mind's eye, because you are seated in the splash zone of West Coast photography. Our first guest is a fourth generation San Franciscan who has been shooting under the sea since 1967. He holds a master's degree in marine biology and worked most of his career with the California Department of Fish and Game in their Granite Canyon Laboratory on the Big Sur Coast. In an effort to protect the ocean he cares about so much, he served on the board of the Carmel Area Wastewater District for 16 years, nine years on the board of the Big Sur Land Trust, and currently sits on the board of trustees of three Central California marine biology groups. He is shot in the waters off British Columbia, Hudson Bay, Alaska, Mexico, South America, and the reefs of the Caribbean, Indo-Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. A course at Monterey Peninsula College with Henry Gilpin, Gilpin put him on the path of the West Coast black and white tradition. I know him through the Image Makers of Monterey and the Sierra Club. Welcome, Art Hazeltine. Thanks, Steve. Our next panelist is a professional photographer who comes from a long line of hunters and fishermen. He began free diving in 1984 and earned a spot on the US free dive team. He competed professionally for five years in waters all around the world and held several US records in depth diving and breath holding for time. He started bringing his camera along when he discovered that his free diving and underwater hunting skills enabled him to blend in with the marine animals as he went about photographing them, holding his breath for up to seven minutes. He's been featured on National Geographic TV and his photography has been published in numerous periodicals including Town and Country and Gourmet magazines. His artistic vision is to translate the calm feeling of acceptance in the water that can only be achieved through free diving. I've been a longtime fan, but I only just got to meet him this morning. I am proud to have Scott Campbell on the program today. Hi, Scott. Thank you, Steve. Our next guest has worked for over 30 years in underwater photography and cinematography from Antarctica to the Amazon. His IMAX motion picture credits include Ring of Fire, Whale Search for the Great Sharks, and the Academy Award-nominated Alaska, Spirit of the Wild and the Living Sea. He's worked extensively with both Jacques Ives Cousteau and his son Jean-Michel Cousteau, and worked on such feature films as Sphere and Chasing Madri Mavericks, as well as documentaries for the BBC, CBS, NBC Universal, Discovery Learning Channel, and National Geographic Channel. He still, his still photographs have been published in Lens Work, Black and White, Orion, Life, National Geographic, Audubon, Nature's Best, Outside, BBC Wildlife, Ocean Realm, and numerous Cousteau publications and books. And in exhibitions by the Ansel Adams Gallery, National Geographic Society Explorers Hall, Center for Photographic Art, Monterey Museum of Art, Brooks Institute, and is included in the permanent collection of the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. He is the author photographer of California Reefs and an advocate for marine conservation, and his imagery is used by many environmental organizations internationally. I'm happy to have Chuck Davis on the show today. Thank Hi, you. Chuck. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> but before we start to take ourselves too seriously, I want to show you some of the most entertaining and comical underwater photography coming from Venice, California, photographer and New York, best New York Times best-selling author, Seth Castile. In 2012, his images, and you're about to see some of them in his video, <clears throat> became an overnight internet sensation when over 100 million people checked out his images in just 24 hours. Please enjoy Seth's photography and how he does it.
was working with a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named Buster in California a couple of years ago. Uh, the idea was to do an on-land photo shoot documenting his personality through a series of photographs. Buster decided he would rather be in the swimming pool than on land. And so he kept jumping in over and over again, chasing a little tennis ball. I'd never seen a dog actually submerge under the water before. I left, I bought a little point and shoot underwater camera, came back and did a couple snapshots. And that was the beginning of the series of underwater dogs. I could just tell there was a connection with dogs in the water and it was just a place for them to really show how incredible they are. Hey everybody, welcome to Underwater Puppies! Keep my eyes up on the page, but every move won't leave my mouth. Seems that I am at the age, what can I do in this old house? Keep me warm and keep me safe, oh, I'm just jumping from the chase. All the kids can understand, I'll never get to the promised land. Welcome back to West Coast Focus, and our discussion about underwater photography is about to begin. Uh, but before, check out Seth's website, because he's always looking for new dogs to model. He tours the country, and uh, you can get all the info on how to get your dog in front of his camera at SethCastile.com. So let's kick off uh, today's discussion with what are your favorite shooting conditions? Not necessarily the optimal shooting conditions, but what are your favorites? Scott, what do you think? Well, I think, obviously, I like warm water, and I love uh, good, clear water. I think it's important that light gets down. I'm kind of limited because I shoot natural light, so, so good, clear water means the deeper I can shoot. Uh, so that's my favorite conditions. Mm -hmm. And what type of visibility are we talking about, like clear water? How far does that get you before the background starts to drop off? Well, y the contrast leaves you pretty quickly, depending on that visibility. Um, but I like to be able to work in 50 to 60 feet and still have a, a sharp image uh, with some contrast to it. But mm -hmm. normally I'm working in shallower areas and to have 30 or 40 feet is, uh, is really nice. Uh, this area where we live here in Monterey, however, uh, you don't get that kind of visibility mm -hmm. normally. And uh, if you've got five or six feet uh, of good visibility, it gets tough. So, so you have to get, have to get clo up close and personal exactly. with the subject matter. Yeah. Chuck, what do you think? Well, for me, I think the most ideal uh, underwater photographic days I've ever had occur off the coast of California. I'm, I'm attracted to cold waters and temperate waters. And uh, where, I, where I do most of my work is right off California, particularly central California. Mm -hmm. um, areas around big uh, Point Lobos and northern reaches of Big Sur. Um, an ideal day for me would be in that region um, in, the, in the late fall, early winter, when we tend to get our best underwater visibility in, uh, in this region. And I also tend to work almost exclusively with available light in black and white. Mm -hmm. And I find that uh, I can be down in 80 or 90 feet of water and look up and see the surface some days on an ideal day. Um, not every day, but on those really good days. And you look up and you see these tightly focused rays of light bursting through the kelp canopy. And the range of light is just extraordinary. And you may see big thick schools of uh, blue rockfish silhouetted there and a sea lion may go by or a harbor seal or a sea otter. And I, sometimes I'll just kneel down on the bottom and take it all. It's like, it's like being in a cathedral. And t those make up for the days when I go up and I got you know two feet of visibility and heavy surge. And, <laughs> and I still photograph those days, but that would be, for me, an ideal day right mm -hmm. here in our, our own backyard. Mm -hmm. It would be like an overcast day for the uh, above water yes, shooters. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. All right, what do you think? Well, I would say there's one word that I look for when uh, looking for the ideal location, and that's diversity. Mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, be able to choose and, and have a lot of choices of what I'm going to photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, I have done most of my photography on the Central California coast here. That's one reason I use uh, artificial light mainly and, uh, and not natural light because you've got to get up close to things mm -hmm. and to see the detail in the critters, and I'm, I'm a critter photographer, mm -hmm. to see the details you need that light. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, places that are diverse, I would say British Columbia and Alaska. I just love diving up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if you go over to the Indo-Pacific, uh, something like Indonesia, uh, just very diverse, a lot of rich coral reefs. Uh -huh. and, uh -huh. that's, and, and of course, what the two of you have said, clear water. It's important. <laughs> yeah. So none of you said, no, uh, you know, water's thick enough. You don't need any haze whatsoever to get the shooting conditions you'd like. It's just perfect clarity. That's that's the best. Yes, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can, on, on days that are not crystal clear, and, and most days aren't, um, sometimes that um, the tendency of the water to uh, add atmosphere to your photograph, can you can use that as a composition element. I've done that a lot. Uh, almost like, I, hate, I don't know how else to describe it, it's like underwater fog. And sometimes it's mm -hmm. at atmospheric and you can use that as, a, as an element. I, I've done that because so, most days out there, they aren't crystal clear in, th in this region where I work mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it'll force me sometimes to, or not, or not force me, encourage me sometimes to uh, maybe leave my shutter open a little bit longer because it is dark. And, and, and it's a surgy, rough day, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what it's all about. That's what, that's what Mother Nature is giving you that day. So why not just go with it, go with the flow, and I'll sometimes, even though it's not really clear, mm -hmm. I'll just start photographing and, and use the, the somewhat blurred or um, time element of it will be really emphasized. So you get lemons, you try to make some lemonade, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, take the salt out of the seawater. There sea you water. go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, let's jump to it. Uh, who's shooting film, who's shooting digital, who's doing both, and um, why? How does it, how, how do you reach your artistic vision based on the equipment you're using? Art, <laughs> okay, I'll start I'll that one off? Yes, <laughs> uh, I started, of course, with film. And that was mainly, uh, very briefly, with the small uh, Nikonos cameras, but then quickly moved to medium format cameras, mm -hmm. which both of you are familiar with. And uh, uh, I worked with those uh, medium format film cameras uh, for many years until digital came along. And then I slowly switched to digital and probably been for the last 10 or 15 years, probably 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, on digital. But one reason I go to digital is because uh, it's so much easier to travel with. And, uh, and also, you don't run out of film after uh, 12 or 24 or 36 shots. Mm -hmm. And you can stay down a long time and just keep taking a lot. I still find myself in the film mode and not taking that many photographs uh, mm -hmm. because I've trained myself that way. Uh, people who have just started with digital, they just blast forever and ever, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'm not in that kind of photography. Yeah, the more you shoot, the more you got to do afterwards yeah. in post-production and make the hard decision of it. Is yeah. it this shot where the fish is looking at me here or this shot that has the beam of light, kind of, you know? Yeah. Right? And, and the post-production is mm -hmm. one of the reasons uh, or one of the main differences between digital and film, and I spent so many years in the dark room, which I enjoy very much, mm -hmm. uh, but then I finally got to the point where I'm, I'm tired of staying up till four o'clock in the morning <laughs> with my hands in, in water <laughs> and wet all the time, uh, even though I really miss the smell of the dark room. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, but now with sitting at a computer, I don't inhale toxic fumes. <laughs> Scott, yeah. what do you think? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm between two master printers in the black and white uh, world, and I, I respect their work immensely. Uh, along that, that line, uh, you know, the uh, traveling with, uh, with film, for me, uh, is a little different than art because I travel down through the water column to, to get my images. And while on breath hold diving, it makes it a little more difficult to carry bigger rigs, which these new, uh, you know, ca digital cameras, you have to w use a housing. So my little Nikonos camera is small, and I'm very maneuverable. So uh, in terms of uh, shooting film, that's one of the reasons I do it. In, in my business, it was a tough transition from film to digital. Now it's complete digital. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can find cameras that'll suit me, that'll fit into small, f small enough housings mm -hmm. now that I'll be able to use uh, underwater too, but I, I, I still am strictly film. Yeah, now that a lot of cameras, 35 millimeter, are going mirrorless to be smaller and lighter weight, um, hopefully that'll be the case with the housing. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Chuck, what do you shoot? Well, all my personal work is done with film, in particular now uh, medium format black and white film, and I work in a, in a wet dark room. That's my personal work. But on my assignment work, I'm pretty fairly well versed in digital, and I'm, 
I'm certainly not anti-digital. There's some amazing <laughs> digital work being done. But um, I've done a lot of electronic cinematography. But for me, um, I'm just attracted to the uh, the analog process. I love I love the darkroom. I love working in there. I'm, when I'm in my darkroom, it's like my inner sanctorum, and I put on my Miles Davis CD, and I'm in there, and there's, it's, there's no time other than my gray, gray flex co uh, clock. And, you know, contrary to popular, uh, some people have this thing that the darkroom is some poisonous swamp or something. With, <laughs> but it's really, you can have a very safe and healthy darkroom with good ventilation if you're careful with your chemistry. It's no more dangerous than common cleaning materials. I'm very careful with my stuff. And it all gets recycled here in Marina, and so I'm careful with that. But I, I really love the process. And I love the tactile feel of going, you know, flipping those prints. I use, uh, I'm careful with my gloves and I use tongs and things on the prints. But uh, that's, it just speaks to me. And I started out that way, very minimalistically. And I went into all kinds of other, as I got older, started when I was like 14 years old. And I got really into it and I got into color. I came around full circle, finally, to going back into a minimalist approach with black and white negative and using a bigger ne negative mm -hmm. medium format. And um, that's just what speaks to me. It's just my calling, I guess, you know. Okay, good. That gives our audience, our viewing audience, a good cross-section of what equipment they might want to try out. Okay, well, it's time for our first break. And now we're going to, we've been talking about the photography, but now we're going to get to see some of the photography by Art and Chuck set to the guitar stylings of Pacific Grove's own Bill Specht. So stick around and enjoy. We'll see you back here in a couple minutes.
Welcome back to West Coast Focus with our guests, Art Hazeltine, Scott Campbell, and Chuck Dace. Uh, Chuck, as an ocean conservationist, what are the biggest uh, effects of climate change and global warming are you seeing uh, under the ocean right now? How can that be photographed to educate people above the water uh, to what's going on? And what are the biggest um, health concerns to our ocean right now? Well, the, the most dramatic evidence of uh, the climate change that I've seen has been in my uh, cinematography work up in the Arctic on, on several trips that I've made up there. And also, s I've worked in the Antarctic as well, but you see it in the, in the poles more dramatically. Uh, this first picture that we have here is of uh, some uh, pack ice out in the Chukchi Sea in the northern reaches of uh, Alaska, Point Barrow, where we did uh, quite a bit of filming work. And the shore fast ice off of the north slope these days, that's the ice that's bound to the land that polar bears need to get out on to, to, to feed. And actually, in Nupiat and uh, Inuit, uh, Eskimos use that to, to, to navigate and to, to hunt. It, it's breaking up sooner. It's not lasting as long. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a shorter season of ice. And by, by breaking up earlier, that exposes the, the continent to more erosion mm -hmm. issues. They're having mm -hmm. issues with the, the land being eroded up there. And some villages are thinking of moving their villages inland more because the, the ice isn't there as, as much, and it's, uh, it's the, uh, the land's uh, being eroded. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the Arctic, the, the poles where you see the most dramatic effect. Um, also in Greenland, where I worked in 1998, uh, and uh, this next photograph is of an iceberg in an ice field off of Lily Sat on the west coast of Greenland, where we're filming an IMAX film. And that uh, Lily Sat area, that, that glacier, is a uh, World Heritage Site, a very active glacier. It's generated the icebergs that, that sunk the Titanic, supposedly. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, that area where we filmed, that face of that glacier where this iceberg was generated that you see, which is about 300 feet tall, by the way, that face of that glacier has receded more than a mile now since 1998. Now that says something. That's uh, such a short amount of time. It's, it is, and it's kind of scary. Bringing it back home here in terms of uh, things that I see locally, we're seeing the effects of, uh, of warmer temperature here, even in Monterey Bay. Some southern species like, like um, the blacksmith fish, very common in Southern California below Plant Conception, mm -hmm. we're seeing those off the breakwater now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, some of our marine life, like uh, some of the, the common stars and bat stars, not bat stars, the sea, sunflower stars, they're pretty much thinned out and disappeared right now because of, they think it's temperature related because of a virus. Hopefully mm -hmm. it's cyclic, it'll come back. And, um, but in relation to that, I think one of the things in terms of the health of our own bay locally is water quality. I know Art has done a lot of uh, good work mm -hmm. to help keep our waters clean, but water quality, this image that I'm showing here right now is just a, a symbolic image of right here on the south side of Monterey Bay where we've had numerous uh, raw sewage spills. But water quality is a serious, it's a threat to Monterey Bay and it's one of the, we always think of extractive activities and things like that, but it's these insidious things that you can't see um, that go into the water and have a long-term insidious effect, including stuff you put on your lawn, the petroleum residue on the street, uh, herbicides, pesticides, all that stuff goes into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And our kids go out to the beach and swim in it and we surf in it and we dive in it and, uh, and, and we can fix that. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to take my hat off to efforts that have been done, like the work Art's done and some of our uh, um, conservation groups that are doing some good work to try to clean that up. But, uh, but that, that's locally what I've seen. Um, mm -hmm. Art, uh, you know, this has been a big part of your career um, and, your, and your advocacy. Uh, what are you seeing? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, ocean acidification mm -hmm. is a very important thing. That, that is, uh, the climate change is resulting in anything that's made with calcium mm -hmm. that is being degraded because the calcium can't form. Uh, you go to the, the uh, tropical reefs mm -hmm. and it's your coral reefs. Mm -hmm. Uh, here in the temperate areas, uh, any, any of your shellfish, your mm -hmm. crabs and your mollusks, mm -hmm. uh, they're having trouble building the shells. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is um, hypoxia, that is increased oxygen, mm -hmm. uh, de excuse me, decreased oxygen. And some critters are having a hard time adjusting to that and there's a lot of studies being done on, on just what is happening there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as Chuck said, I think water quality is so major, both your urban runoff and your agricultural runoff. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects everywhere we go. Uh, you go to, to Mexico and you, you see it there definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, gee, uh, Cozumel is one place I've really seen the, the water quality go down tremendously. And there's so much development along the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, it just runs off and uh, affects the environment. And uh, Scott, um, how can, as photographers, how can we illustrate um, this to people so they can understand it when they can't be in the ocean or undersea themselves to witness it? Well, <clears throat> I think some of the places that we are, are some of the richest waters in the world and um, you know 
I've been diving in them for 30, 40 years, and that, and when you, if, if we have images from the way it was, and then show images the way it is now, uh, th that can have a profound effect. I, um, one of my favorite photographers, uh, Wayne Levin, is is documenting the bleaching of uh, reefs in Hawaii, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing those relationships through the phot photographs. Um, but I think even beyond what we're doing to the water, what we're doing to the animal life in the ocean is really important to, to, to be aware of. You know, long lining, overfishing, things like that mm -hmm. are also something that we need to really be aware of and, and be mindful of. Mm -hmm. So if we want to keep shooting the ocean, keep shooting its natural beauty, we've got to take care of it. And so uh, now we're going to see some beautiful videography work from our sponsor, Backscatter Underwater Video and Photo, right here in Monterey. Um, and you'll get to enjoy some of that beauty uh, in living color. So enjoy, and we'll see you back here in three minutes. Welcome back to West Coast Focus and our discussion about underwater photography. And Backscatter really has everything an underwater photographer would need, whether you're just starting out or advanced. Uh, they have it all. Make it your first and last stop for underwater photography. And this show wouldn't be possible without the generous support of our sponsors like Backscatter and also Terry Lebda Administrative Services in Marina for their generous financial support. Guys, where does uh, Backscatter's been here in the Monterey area for a long time, and this is such a mecca for underwater photography. How does Backscatter fit into the photographic history of the Monterey area? Well, that was some amazing footage, by the way. We're very mm -hmm. fortunate to have Backscatter here right in our, in our backyard. And as far as I know, um, historically, it's the first uh, comprehensive facility 
catering to professional and, and both amateur underwater photographers ever established and it's it's really a, a world-class seriously a world-class facility and they also have a, a facility on the East Coast now as well and uh, I've known Berkeley White the founder and um, of, of Backscatter for many years I consider him a colleague but also a, a very good friend and when you go to Backscatter, one of the neat things I like about Backscatter, I mean, you can buy virtually any kind of housing or lighting system you can think of there for still or movie cameras. But you not only get the, the housing or the piece of equipment, you get support from them. You can call up Berkeley and go in there. They've tested all that gear. They dive the equipment that they sell. They go out and they use it. They know all of its idiosyncrasies. And they can save you hours and hours, days, maybe weeks of trial and error when you first get it by all the things that they've discovered on how to use it. Very helpful that way, very supportive. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm very, very grateful they're here in Monterey Bay. And Scott, your, your studio's right upstairs from them, isn't it? Yeah, I see them quite a bit. Actually, when I have a problem, I go downstairs and they solve it uh, immediately. <laughs> so it's a really great asset for me. But I'll tell you, not only, though, do they provide the best, uh, you know, uh, menu of equipment that you can buy, um, there is no other camera store in Monterey or even the Bay Area that has such a comprehensive amount of equipment and answers to the questions that you have. They have more answers. Uh, you know, they basically underwater photography. People get into it; they need educating, and they br they bring that along. And not only that, I've done two uh, you know expeditions with them, and they have a really great uh, program that they take people out, and you can you can go on trips with them. So I you know that and and that is all photographers, and it's some of the best places in the world. Mm. Art. Well, I've dealt with the Backscatter, and, and Berkeley White has been a friend since their very beginning here, which I can't think of how many years ago that was. Uh, but we are so fortunate to have that. It's a natural place for the, the best underwater photography store in the country because of our submarine canyons here, uh, the ease of access uh, to get in the water, good diving conditions. There have been stores, uh, uh, underwater photography stores in the Bay Area or Los Angeles or San Diego or, uh, or Texas, but they just don't make it. You know, Backscatter has, uh, has been there. There are a great bunch of people in there. Uh, and some of the people that have been employees of Backscatter, they've gone on and become professional underwater photographers and are really making a living at it themselves. Yeah. I see a lot of their, their staff, I follow a lot of the staff members there on Facebook, so I get to see their personal yeah. work as they're doing it and their growth as photographers as they improve yes. too, which is really cool. Yeah. So uh, talking about uh, growth as photographers, um, who were your mentors coming up? Uh, what photographers do you look up to? Well, I, I'd, I'd start with, uh, for the fine art photography, uh, uh, the West Coast tradition of photography, I would say Henry Gilpin is number one. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, taught at Monterey Peninsula College for more than three decades, and uh, he's passed away now, but uh, he influenced my life so much. Uh, but uh, in that same uh, group of photographers, the West Coast tradition would be uh, John Sexton and um, uh, Roger Vermeer and Dick Garrett mm -hmm. would be those would be the four that have really influenced me for the for the black and white photography for underwater photography I would say one person who has been my colleague and friend for over 50 years and that's Dan Gotchell and Dan uh, has he's a retired marine biologist with the Department of Fish and Game he's in his mid 80s now so he's not diving anymore but he's written many books on uh, underwater critter identification, and he has influenced my underwater photography uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I would give a lot of credit to Dan. Mm -hmm. Scott, who do you draw inspiration from? Well, it's a good question. I think, you know, one of the reasons I settled in this area is because it was steeped in the West Coast black and white photography. Um, with respect to the marine world, um, you know, and, and in that world, the, the old school was Brett Weston and Ansel Adams and Morley Bear and all those guys uh, had beautiful imagery that really influenced me and it still carries me through. Uh, and, and, and that's directed with my underwater work. Art Hazeltine here was, when I first saw one of his <laughs> underwater images, it blew me away because it was very challenging uh, to, to make black and white fine art images. And that's our challenge here is, is bridging to the fine art world. It's always been a decorative art or stock photography, location type of photography. That is our challenge, is bridging it. But um, one guy that I must mention is, uh, is, that I mentioned earlier is Wayne Levin. His, if you ever get a chance to look at his work, it's unbelievable and he's committed his life to it. I really respect him and his work is unbelievable. So uh, I've become good <coughs> friends with him and uh, he's, uh, he's, you know, he shoots strictly black and white uh, underwater and it's amazing. Chuck, what about your influences? Well, chronologically, uh, I started out 
diving in the foreground pretty young. And uh, really, Jacques Cousteau had a huge impact on me as, as a kid. I read The Silent World and World Without Sun and watching the Cousteau specials. And even the work of Lamar Bourne, who shot the black and white footage of the old Sea Hunt series. I was raised on that. And that made a huge impact on my life. And I had a great art teacher in high school, uh, Mr. Ted Hewitt, who I learned basic darkroom printing from in high school. I could go in and print some of my first rolls of underwater available at work that I shot with my Nikonis camera. And then I got into Brooks Institute, and I was very, you know, um, uh, impressed with er Ernest Brooks's black and white work, which I, I, I'm very lucky to, I still know Ernie, I'm in touch with him, I, I went diving with him uh, earlier, uh, last year actually, uh, to celebrate his 80th birthday, and he was still diving. <laughs> and then, uh, so Ernie was a huge influence on me, and still is. And then as I, uh, I'm also um, very fortunate, I've had some great workshops and, and learned from other master printers, like my friend Brad Cole, uh, I've had great workshops with John Sexton and Ryuji <laughs> Douglas, um, and I'm also very, uh, I've been very enamored and, and inspired by the works of William Kurtzinger, who I, I consider a friend. I was very lucky to work as an assistant for, for Bill. I did 30 some odd years in National Geographic, and uh, Bill's an amazing person, does incredible work. And I'm also a big fan of Wayne Levin as well, and I met him through, through uh, Scott in Hawaii, and, and Wayne, I just can't say enough good things about his work. It's just, uh, I would Google Wayne and check out his work if you're interested in fine art underwater photography. And also, um, I'm also, I'm inter I'm, I've been influenced by other artists that aren't necessarily underwater photographers, the mm -hmm. masters, all of the Westons, and Ansel Adams, and Wynne Bullock, and there's so many, I'm going to forget some of them. I know. And those <laughs> had a huge impact on me in, in the West Coast tradition that I'm very much um, affected by and mm -hmm. that I embrace. So that's kind of my chronological influence there. Yeah, of the of the names that have been mentioned here, I'll agree with uh, most of those. There's a few new ones that I'm gonna I look forward to looking those up. But I'll throw one more name out, uh, Will Giles. Well, that's what I was just gonna. It's been I, a big influence on my work. I, I meant to. I've got. A, a, mm -hmm. uh, I get nervous when I'm on camera, but I, <laughs> William Giles has also been a long-term mentor of mine, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about him later. But Will also has helped me tremendously, and I didn't meet Will until the '90s, which is which is a while ago. But Will has also been very helpful. Mm -hmm. He's not a underwater photographer, but his his ability um, uh, to sequence images and his vision and, and his ability to um, to be a great teacher, uh, he, I can't thank Will enough. He's been a really a, a, a really positive influence for me. Yeah, and for me, growing up, National Geographic magazine, that's probably the single biggest source of influence on my photography uh, throughout my life. Okay, well, it's time to see some more photography. Now we're going to see a slideshow of Scott's work as well as my own, and of course, uh, to the musical stylings of uh, our own Bill Specht. So stick around and enjoy. We'll see you back here in a couple more minutes to continue our discussion. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to West Coast Focus, where we've got a whole panel of great underwater photographers, and I want to hear what they've got coming up next. Art, what's on the horizon for you? Well, I'll continue with what I do. Uh, you know, I'm really not interested in, in chasing after other people in their kind of photography. I, I, I really like the combination of biology and underwater uh, and uh, the West Coast tradition of photography. And so I'll continue going with photographs that, that concentrate on detail, uh, uh, fine focus, uh, high contrast, but yet a good tonal range, uh, uh, and of course composition and lighting. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see reason to change it, so I'll just keep doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. To continue yeah. mastering your craft. Yes. Very yeah. good. Scott, what's up for you? Well, I think, you know, in terms of business, we're chugging along just fine. I love what I do. I love working with people. We shoot a lot of uh, advertising work, editorial, and family work. Uh, so we, um, we're, I'm really happy with the staff that we have in the direction we're going. With respect to my personal work, um, I, I, I'm never doing enough of it, but <laughs> hopefully, you know, the kids are getting bigger and the family's uh, uh, a little bit more independent, I can take off and do, spend a little more time. So that's my goal so with respect to my personal work is to get out to places and do more work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jack, what are you working on? Well, as far as my personal work, I have a couple projects that I'm working on. One's on the back burner, one's on the front burner, but on the back is a, a book that I've been working on for many years called Below California. Uh, a preamble of which was published in Lenswork magazine a little while back. And, and, uh, but on the very front burner, I'm working on a, a film on my, a mentor and longtime friend, William Giles, who's given me a tremendous amount of help and inspiration over the years. And I started out to make, uh, started out eight years ago with this film, and it was going to be probably a half hour film on his life. And well, it was like peeling back the, the blades of, a, of an onion as I got deeper and deeper and deeper into Will's life and his work. It was it was like a feature film, and it's going to have to be a lot. It'll probably be 90 minutes when we're done with it to really do justice to the man, a man that lived b before he was even a year old. He, he took off with his family to Europe and South Africa and Argentina, lived on four different continents, spoke two different languages, and didn't come back to the States till he was 16. And that has a huge influence on how people see the world and how mm -hmm. they perceive it. And, uh, and it just goes on and on. I'll try to keep it brief, but his life is really, uh, it's, it's an amazing story, and I, I hope I can do justice to it. And hopefully we're coming down the home stretch with it, I hope, this year. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's one of the most spiritual photographers yes, I know. very much. And uh, just a lot of his teachings um, go over my head initially, and I really have to give a lot of thought and meditation to just yeah. uh, a handful of points to, to understand them and sort of like savor them. Yes, and the spirit comes out in his work, and he had very important spiritual teachers like, like Minor White, for example, mm -hmm. who started his students off, instead of worrying about f-stops and shutter speeds and tripods, he was having his students look inward into the psyche and mm -hmm. study uh, the philosophers like Gurdjieff and other spiritual disciplines before they got the camera in front of their eye. And Will's, uh, uh, I guess a disciple of Minor White, but he's found mm -hmm. his own voice, and you can see mm -hmm. Minor's influence big time in Will's work. Well, when you're ready to release that film, we'll have to have you come back on the show and introduce, glad to. <laughs> and introduce it. So, um, I have a new exhibit of 16 photos up at uh, UC Santa Cruz's MBEST Center uh, in Marina, and then also uh, many of the images that you just saw in my slideshow uh, are available in my limited edition science fiction photo novella, Visions from the Collective. And uh, you can get that from the merchandise section off of my website. Now, this is the part of the show called Reflections in the Developer Tray, where we like to leave you with a little something to reflect on after the show. And I find nothing more meditative uh, than the imagery of Ryuji and his uh, collaborations with Camille Lenore. So um, you're really going to enjoy this.
Welcome back to West Coast Focus, our discussion on underwater photography. And remember to uh, post and check out all the photography happenings in Monterey County at Monterey Peninsula Photo Events. That's mpenphotoevents.blogspot.com. Uh, <clears throat> So now, you guys, uh, most color photography we see in magazines, you know, it's underwater, it's color. You guys are doing black and white. And when I got to this area and saw, it was uh, three of your, your imagery, and saw black and white, I'd never really seen black and white underwater imagery before, but you're sort of de dedicated to it. And I want to talk about your darkroom process uh, uh, for your printing, because you all do that a little bit differently. Um, but you get some, some warm effects or some cool effects. So what are you doing in the darkroom to achieve that, and um, what's the artistic purpose behind it? Go ahead, Chuck. Well, my, uh, my de facto um, kind of print look that I tend to go for, I'm, I'm very much influenced by the West Coast School, and I like that full tonal range and the range of light. And um, I tend to uh, have a cooler uh, look to it with a mild selenium toning to it to give to punch up the blacks a little bit. And I print my prints for that, pro knowing that I'm going to selenium tone. Mm -hmm. But I've experimented also with warm toners on some print. Ruji Douglas was beautiful work we just saw. Uh, kindly gave me a wonderful formula for poly toner that I've used to experiment with on some images. And also some of my platinum prints that, that uh, Ruji also taught me how to print platinum. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a bit of a warm tone. Some images work better in a warm, uh, warm than cold. But most of my work is more of a cooler effect. Mm -hmm. And in terms of black and white, though, I'm just attracted to it because I I feel like I can accentuate shape and light and form better. And, and out here where I work in California, it seems to be a world of shadows. And you get down deep, there isn't much color. And if I want to captivate that feeling or capture that feeling, it seems like black and white for me captures that feeling better. But that's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scott, how about you? Well, you know, the challenge for me for black and white is, is really the challenge itself. I think um, I'm in the middle here, and it's interesting. He's all wet, wet in, the, <laughs> you know, in terms of his processing, too, of his prints. And I, you know, I respect black and white silver prints more than anything else. He's gone strictly digital, so he digital prints and digital captures. Where I'm in the middle, I do the film and I, and I do the digital printing. We scan an egg. So not that I, I don't want to, I want to go back to the uh, wet printing, <laughs> uh, but it, it's just so time consuming now for me that uh, it's hard for me to do. But, but the black and white really does a, a challenge in terms of trying to bring out an emotional response without the color because we're so used to, bam, seeing blue water and mm -hmm. orange fish and, and things like that. But to really bring an emotional content from a black and white image is really a challenge. And it's always been that way for me. Mm -hmm. Art. Well, I'm not doing darkroom work anymore, but my challenge is to make the digital work look like darkroom mm -hmm. work because I agree with Scott. The silver print really is, it, 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 it's still got that edge over a digital print. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that will change, and I'll be ready to move into it when it does. The papers are getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm switching over one of my printers into a pisography uh, mm. system now, which mm -hmm. is all shades of black. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that, because I think that will get me even closer to the silver print. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm, a, I, uh, uh, I, I'm all digital. Um, I used to shoot film and scan the negatives and then do the post-production all digital and end with a digital print. But nowadays, I really, I have, you know, I have a Holga. Um, I just got, right. I, I, uh, uh, I just got a hold of a Yashica twin lens reflex uh, from a friend who passed it on to me. 127 film is very hard to yeah. find these days. Is there an underwater housing for it? <laughs> you, you can build, you can build one. Talk it, to Berkeley. It, it, might, be, it might be a Ziploc bag. Or an aquarium. Yeah. Okay, well, this has been uh, our fourth episode uh, of West Coast Focus, and I have to tell you how grateful I am to have this forum to show you some of the finest talent in photography today. 
uh, the photographers that I recruit to be on this panel, um, I'm already a huge fan of. I look to them for inspiration. But when I receive their portfolios and biographies, my appreciation for them and their contributions to the art form are taken to a new level. And that's really the goal of West Coast Focus. And I hope you're in as inspired as I am by the work we're presenting to you here. <clears throat> And we've got lots more coming in the months uh, ahead, so stick with us, tune in. You can always see past episodes at stevesmac.com, West Coast Focus TV. Um, that's our program. Thank you, Art, Scott, and Chuck. Thanks to Rayuji, uh, Camille Le Lenore, and Seth Castile for their photography, as well as the original music by Bill Specht and Michael Martinez directing from the control room. Uh, of course, a big thank you to our sponsor, Backscatter, and the generosity of Terry Lebda uh, Administrative Services in Marina. Tune in August 8th when we showcase the very successful Weston Scholarship Program with photographer panelists Lane Olson, Eduardo Sandoval, and Edwin Franco. And boy, you're going to see some work like you've never seen before on this show. Real creative approach from up and coming artists in this area. And we'll also feature uh, an interview and a brief documentary about the program uh, that features the program founders, Gina and Kim Weston. Then uh, on September 8th, um, it's all about pushing the wet darkroom. We talked a little bit about that today, but we're gonna have guests Martha Cassinave, Jane Olin, and Robin Robinson, also a great underwater photographer, uh, with a darkroom demo from Zach Weston. So be sure to tune in in August and September for those. Uh, you can view past episodes, as I mentioned, of West Coast Focus TV off of my website, stevesmac.com, West Coast Focus TV. They're on YouTube and Vimeo, easy to search. And as always, you have my guarantee that you'll see at least 100 photos per episode. We easily cross that mark today. May your housing stay sealed and the wildlife stay friendly. Thanks for focusing on the West Coast. Now get off the couch and go get wet.